users to understand how different user cohorts, different marketing partners uh, perform against key business metrics like acquisition as well as um, engagement, retention, monetization, ultimately lifetime value. I'm Asaf with uh, AppSpire. Uh, we're a native ad network uh, focused on creating unique uh, native experiences on mobile. Uh, I lead the North American team uh, working with developers. Uh, that's about it. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Bernbreyer, uh, Director of Business Development for AppLift. Um, AppLift is also, it's crazy to hear, uh, a mobile marketing platform. Uh, we focus exclusively on mobile games and uh, in turn you come to us, we act as agency for you and we find you the high quality users across 1500 different media partners and we focus very heavily on LTV optimization and ROI positive spending. And I know you're also going to be very surprised about this, but we are incredibly native and uh, we like to use things like organic and contextual and stuff like that, but uh, that's how we built our company. Hi guys, I'm Adam Bavoli. I work with Flurry and Shocker. We do have a marketing component as well. Uh, but we're one of the biggest mobile analytics companies. We also have an advertising component. I work on the publisher relations team, so I'm tasked with helping our developers that use analytics monetize with not only our video ad network, but our, our TV marketplace as well. Awesome. Okay, so what I thought we'd start with, just for folks in the room, um, before we get into uh, marketing war, um, is probably just take a moment and just explain like the, the subject of the panels around lifetime value. And, and maybe we can do a quick rundown if anyone's got a really great pithy definition they want to give to the group, or if you want to just give a summary of what you think um, lifetime value is. Sure, I'll kick it off. Um, I think it's really basic. It's basically gross revenue that you're going to recognize as a result of the relationship with the user uh, over the term of that relationship. I think that you some people might get into, say, subtracting the costs of acquiring that user, but I think it's, it's pretty important to look at it from a gross versus net perspective, as profitability is just such a larger discussion with so many more facets. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. It's really, how much money can you make off someone off of the period of time that you want to engage it with? Um, everyone's got a different metric, so I think 30 days is a pretty good scheme, but uh, how much money can you feasibly make with that user over the 30 days? Everything else is just kind of granular, nitty-gritty stuff. All right, great. So let's let's move it on and go a bit deeper. So for folks who, you know, folks like us in the ad tech space, right? So we're competing um, already at the high end. So OpenX, for those who don't know, is kind of second to Google in the US in terms of ads served um, for our exchange and also for our ad server. And for us, you know, when we've been launching native, we've been launching native and install, right? And then, guys buying that are doing that to boost their lifetime value. So I'm interested in kind of what the panel thinks, especially about moves that are going on this week. There's been a ton of announcements around driving install ads from everyone from AOL to Google, um, of course Twitter and MoPub, who've been working on it for a while, and how that kind of turns and transitions into driving lifetime value. Um, so maybe uh, some comments and thoughts, and how, um, you know, has the game changed would be my first question. I think uh, it validates the market. That, I think that's the, the, the major sign here that every big company in the space is now doing this. First, you know, when Facebook launched that uh, last year, you know, no one was sure this is going somewhere and it's going to be as big as it is. It became a billion dollar business quarterly for them and probably three or five X that on a global level. Um, I, I think it's great that these companies are, uh, are in there and I think it's great that we have some solid companies here doing uh, similar things uh, and, and, and getting there. And I think it's the most important thing is uh, it's very good for developers because it gives them a wider array of options and opportunities to go and test and iterate and uh, get into a bidding war or a pricing war or, or get more bang for their buck when they're acquiring users and make sure that they are ROI positive on their user acquisitions. I keep hearing the word war thrown around. Uh, I like to think it mutually beneficial success. And uh, there's a lot of people here that do really great things across a, a number of different ways. Um, but I think what you're hearing with all these different platforms that we've known as advertising platforms, traditionally branding, CPM dollars, that sort of stuff, now going to CPI models, now looking for user acquisition. Uh, what it tells me is, 
there is value in the app space, and even though we all know that in this room, the populace as a whole kind of brushes it off. They're like, yeah, 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 apps or whatever, but really it's apps first nowadays. Um, and and what, what I like to think of is uh, the lifetime value of zero users is zero dollars. So if you're not acquiring users, you're not making any money. So you have to have a valuable and viable solution to get those users. And the more native you can get it, the more reach you can have on Facebook or with AOL, and the more contextual and the placement, that sort of thing, then you're going to get an engaged user, which in turn drives up your value. So it's kind of that waterfall effect. Awesome. So, so then I'd ask, the kind of, oh, you want to add? Yeah, do you mind if I cut in? Uh, I think an announcement that was not made this last week, that was actually made a couple weeks ago, um, Apple's uh, I guess clarification of their policy on IDFAs has a pretty big, or at least what we're seeing from you know the kind of like media agnostic measurement partner, um, the IDFA clarification that using IDFAs to not only attribute installs but also attribute downstream events is an acceptable use of that IDFA is really going to change the game in terms of measurement. And what we're seeing is is basically apps tracking users on a much longer term basis as a result. Uh, not necessarily just, you know, that say install and then applying some sort of proxy measure like my average user is worth this much, but being able to see the actual lifetime value of a user as they buy something, as they don't buy something, as they engage six months down the road, I think is going to uh, be a big boon for, I guess, the app marketing industry as we can continue to, to basically get credit for that uh, that acquisition in the first place and then the re-engagements on the road. Great, so you know I have um, my own apps and I had an app um, you know, development cloud services company before joining OpenX and so I used to buy you know in some of the initial formats you could buy installs on and I as a developer I was you know particularly interested in you know how I connect the app installs that I buy Right to um, you know the lifetime value and the usage through a series of events. So um, what I'd be interested in, and, and maybe some folks in the room are in the same situation, of how do I stitch all that together and track that in a really useful way? Um, so I figure you guys might be able to help me answer this. Um, so maybe we can start on the end. Yeah, I was going to uh, pass it off to one of the other guys because currently Flurry is tracking a lot of mobile usage as far as daily sessions. Um, the amount of users that are coming across that application on a daily basis. Uh, but sitting down with the UA team, me being on the publisher side, I think there's more of a need to look into LTV from a platform standpoint. I mean, these guys can, can jump in and talk about it. You know, it's just amazing where kind of the advertising spend is going these days. I remember I was actually part of Quattro Wireless that was acquired by Apple and we became IAD and all of our publishers are looking for brand, 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 that's all I want running on my app because that's going to command the highest CCPMs. Whereas now, you're seeing a lot of spend come from the app development world and how are you going to actually track that effectively? Um, we're going to help you market those apps, but in a way, I think there's a, a huge need for more LTV capabilities on, on the platforms and I think uh, some of my, my colleagues here have it in theirs. Yeah, I guess, I don't want to... Let's pitch it away. I was, I was it away. It, it might be kind of more in, in AppSolar's wheelhouse. Uh, just based on the fact that it's basically a platform that's going to track, hey, it came from this channel, and then six months down the road converted. You know, you see in certain verticals like travel and retail where they're more considered purchases, you're not going to be able to monetize a user for a, a long period of time, if ever. And so that, that LTV needs to extend for that period of time. It's easy in mobile because there are these static IDs, of course, in Android and in iOS. And as long as you're working with a platform that kind of has the capacity to deal with the data for that period of time, and you stay with that platform for that period of time, of course, uh, more and more people are, are, are looking more downstream. I think they're also breaking down silos for LTV, being able to connect if, if for instance, they have multiple apps, a uh, big app development shop would perhaps look at a user across all of their apps and calculate the value of that user. I think that perhaps companies that have more than just a mobile presence, like a, like a travel company, for example, that has loyalty programs, they can track that user by their loyalty number. 
So, so my follow-up would be, so if I, if I know that and I can track that, right, how do I optimize my spend then based on that? I mean, are those tools existing? Can I hook those up today? Or, or are we at a point where we can't quite seal that in one place? Funny that you would mention that. Um, I know this company, it's called AppLift, and uh, we utilize all that data that you send us to help optimize your LTV and track it downstream to then find you the sources that have the highest quality users and optimize those even more. So I think all of us here, we're not the ones developing the apps. So we can do things like in-app purchases or tweaking of the app itself to impact LTV. But what we can do is help suggest. And we can also take the information that you provide for us and say, why don't you try tweaking it here? So we can impact it based on where they're reaching and how they're interacting with their users. And so that's why we do it with, again, all the native advertisements and stuff like that. If you're able to position it in a way where someone says, hey, this looks cool, I want to engage with it, they engage with it, you immediately get that data point, and then you follow that user across the path. And then you can say, okay, this particular creative style or this particular placement is going to generate generally this type of LTV. Let's go this route. And this type of placement is going to get this. All right, let's X that out. And so what we do is we say, give us as much possible information as you can. We'll do the BI for you. Let's take it off your plate. We have some partners that don't even do the BI anymore. We do it all for them. And we say, these guys produce this. You have this, this cohort that produces this, et cetera. And we can track it as long as they're willing to share the information. We'll, we'll do that BI for them. And then ultimately, we drive that high LTV. That's definitely what developers need. I mean, there's so much focus on in-house development and what they need to do to keep their UI going and keep users actually coming back that why should they be stuck focusing on that type of stuff? That's where you know companies like ourselves and, and AppLift actually come in and are able to help with that. So just tipping it off to you there. To be, uh, to be a little contrarian here, um, these guys are great and work for amazing companies. Uh, and I think that as a developer, uh, maybe small to mid-scale, mid-level developers could afford kind of taking the BI side out of their own backyard, but you know the big guys and the largest guys out there, they keep all of it in-house. They want all the attribution to be in-house or using a platform and owning that information. Uh, and if you want to go big, you have to, you have to do that yourself. You have to own that information. You have to control those funnels um, in-house and see uh, where every user came from. Um, from the first time he clicked on an ad somewhere and I don't know, 12 months later when he bought his first in-app purchase. Uh, and that's the kind of information and kind of uh, approach that you can only have in-house because you cannot share all the information with external partners and there's some information that's going to always stay internal and you have to know how to analyze that and act on that. With enough trust you can share all the data. Just want to put that out. And, and so what's the, the goal with that, right? So uh, to your point, I think that that's, you know, if you could help um, an individual developer optimize their spend, right? So if you can say, hey, you know, um, I, uh, someone is available for XCPM that's gonna drive a high amount of active usage in your app, and we know that because similar users are driven a high active usage. Even that person's not on your kind of owned and operated network, which I think you're suggesting. You don't have all that data, but you're able to track them across multiple places. That seems valuable, you know, right? Like that. No, it is. It is. I'm not saying don't share the information. I'm, I'm more than happy, and I think sharing kind of post-install events is super important and crucial to LTV and to user acquisition in general. Um, but what I'm saying is that you have to have your own kind of data warehouse in-house uh, and do your own analytics and uh, own, uh, uh, own work on that on top of what you're doing with uh, user acquisition with the uh, agencies ad networks or whatever you have to own that information because that's the most valuable information that's information of where your revenue comes from and you can't have that outside only you have to own internally to be able to, to to do something about it to be proactive and do a lot more things than just agency, user acquisition, and, and the likes, which is super important, whether you do it with AppSpire or with uh, AppLift or with anyone else. Um, but you have to own that information as well as share specific kind of snippets of it uh, to, to make your user acquisition better. Okay, great. Uh, 
Um, I think there's a product in there somewhere. <laughs> so um, let me change tack a little. So, so one of the questions kind of um, we, we had on the list was just what are the tactics, right? So if someone comes into any of you guys today and say, hey, I want to, you know, I want to maximize the LTV of my app. What are the kind of things that you, you recommend? Apart from, of course, subscribing. <laughs> but like, how do, you, how do you walk them through that? Uh, and I know it's different by channel, it's different by vertical, but like, can you break that down a little just for the group? Yeah, sure. Um, go ahead, buddy. You got it. <laughs> so I guess I think it really depends on the stage of, of your app and the stage of your relationship with that user. Uh, I would say that, of course, you want to acquire them, of course. But once you acquire them, you need to focus on user experience so they engage in the first place. You need to make sure that your app has, uh, has a life cycle that will encourage retention. Uh, it's not a game that ends after two levels, for example. Uh, from there, I think that what we're starting to see, and it's really in early days, but after acquiring a user, being able to go out and retarget that user within other apps, to send them emails, to send them push notifications. Um, if it's cost effectively done, it obviously has a ton of potential because we've seen it work in display. Um, everyone knows that retargeting is huge and by far the most effective tactic. Yeah, mine is all, all UI. I mean, being, being an ex-Apple guy, um, everyone was always saying, uh, how do I get a contact at the App Store? What do I have to do to get attention there? And it's always the same answer I got back from them was make a great app and it's going to get recognized and it's going to be sticky and have those users coming back. Obviously easier said than done. Little luck obviously involved in there as well. Um, but I think uh, things like in-app purchases or putting ads in, it's really the developer's choice at the end of the day. Do they want to build that user base first? Uh, make a great product and then once they cross a certain threshold uh, start monetizing those users or do they want to come firing out of the gate? Um, it's definitely a developer by, by developer choice, but you know with all the options that they have out there I think uh, you know no matter which way they look to go uh, Whether it's starting to monetize right off the bat or not uh, they they really can't go wrong by just making a seamless and great user experience to have the users coming back. UI. I would agree with that um, on a lot of different levels. I mean, if, if you have a pretty app, if you have something that, that catches my eye, I'm more likely to engage with it. And that's also going to lower your user acquisition costs because if it looks cool, if the creators you have around it based on the in-app experience are really engaging, then all right, I want to click on it, I want to play. Um, but uh, he's right when he says, it depends on each app, and uh, I think we can all agree that you are not, again, what I said earlier, is you're not going to monetize anything if you don't have a user base. So before you really start thinking about monetization, obviously you want to have kind of like in the, in the back of your mind, but ultimately you need to think, how am I going to get people into this game? So you have a lot of different avenues for user acquisition up here, but ultimately it's let's get the users, and then we can turn around and monetize them. LTV, to me, isn't just a dollar amount. There's a lot of value that isn't exactly dollars. It's it's what is your reach? What is your impact on society? How many people are talking about you? What's the virality of your app? Things like that. That has an inherent value, right? So WhatsApp wasn't making any money, but they just got paid a huge amount for all those users. They weren't monetizing, but they were making money in the long term. So you have to think, okay, what is my expected value? What what is my opportunity cost right now? I'd rather make ten dollars in a week than make fifty cents today. Right? Or you can say, hey, I'll pay you a dollar a day for the next 10 years, or right now, I'll give you $1,000. I'm going to take a dollar a day for the next 10 years. Right? I just made $3,650 instead of $1,000. So that's what you've got to think about in terms of the app. And ultimately, it's getting the people in your app. That's how you're going to influence LTV more than anything. I think this is a great point. And I think, uh, I think it's all about balancing your love for the users versus your love for money. And trying to combine that is kind of a something you need to uh, to find a smart way to balance uh, to balance out. Uh, and I think as the more aggressive you go in every any avenue, whether it be pushing in-app purchases or pushing ads in their face, it's it's all about you understanding and balancing that out. Uh, and there's also a layer of segmentation, which is a super important layer where you want to target the right type of users with the right monetization approach. 
if you see a certain behavior that makes you realize or think that this user is going to be a whale, is going to be a big spender, don't bombard them with ads. Uh, the day before they were planning to pay $50 for an in-app purchase. Or vice versa, if you see a behavior or a pattern of a user that looks like they're not going to pay ever, then you don't have to bombard them with ads, but you, have, you can show them a few ads, engaging ads, respectful, uh, clear in terms of the user experience, uh, and make great money. Um, and I, th I think it's all an act of balance. Yeah, most of us on this panel do have the capabilities within our platforms to say, okay, these are my users that are paying, these are my users that are not paying. So a lot of high revenue grossing games out there do identify those users and make sure that, okay, if I'm not going to be able to make money off of IAP on this user, then I'm going to show them the ad. So getting a little strategic uh, you know, with your uh, monetization options is, is a smart bet too. Okay, great. So we've had love, we've had war. <laughs> um, and I, I think just one thing I'd add just to that uh, comment, what, what we've seen certainly at OpenX, we, we have an SDK for natives that we've been uh, lucky enough to install with a whole range of folks from you know smaller to larger publishers who are then looking to monetize in a ton of different ways. And what we see is the type of ads that you put in as well can affect, as you mentioned, that lifetime value and the type of users that you then target those to and how you do that monetization has an effect, both can be positive and negative, on LTV. But the more immersive, the more kind of embedded and the more um, you know, better UI and better techniques you use to embed those um, obviously help. And we kind of believe that the future is going to be around ad products that you create that are very tailored to your experience and that drive things like you know, in more in-app purchases, more sponsored content, and things that are not just purely, um, you know, I click on a banner, right? And I think you see the whole industry moving away from that. And I think that's a great tool for folks in the room uh, to use because, you know, the, that previous world where you had to put a banner on to drive any monetization um, is, is going away rapidly, um, which is great. So, so lastly, what I wanted to ask everyone is, you know, what's next? What's, what's coming up to drive LTV? Uh, you know, uh, how can I do kind of more re-engagement? Um, for me, it, seemed, it seems crazy that you can publish the App Store um, with all your new features, but I don't get told about those unless I kind of go look for them or the update gets pushed to me. Um, so, so what's coming next and, and what do you guys think is going to happen to the industry around this area? Yeah, I, I can jump on it. Um, I probably just focus on, on games right now, specifically uh, Flurry in the past has helped a lot of game developers with their monetization needs and I think that's been a, a really good niche for us and where I see uh, things evolving a lot into is video. I know people say, you know, native, native, native and that's great because uh, it's a more trusted experience. I think native users are, are pretty savvy and I'm in the advertising business myself and there's only a select type of banner ads that I'll choose to engage with. So, you know, native, uh, I'm definitely on board with you. Uh, video is a, is a great way, I think, also to keep users coming back because uh, companies like us and Ad Colony also have a rewarded feature. By rewarded, I don't mean download this app and you get a reward, but for example, like somebody like Ivanji or, or Temple Run, if you, you know, get chased out by the monster and you fall down, you can actually come back by watching, say, this Ford trailer. So uh, video is something that I think is, is growing as well as uh, programmatic buying, but I don't want to open up a whole can of worms, but, you know, video for me, in, incentivizing, kind of a dirty term these days, so I want to say rewarding the user for watching a video, to receive more coins, to receive more uh, in-app currency. To jump on that, I would say that video is typically thought of as, as a really strong branding platform. And what we've been seeing more and more adoption of in terms of uh, campaigns that we're tracking is performance video from providers like, like Fungal, for example, where they're actually showing videos of the game that they're advertising and offering those campaigns on a CPI basis. Uh, they're performing really, really well across the board, and I think it's a, a different approach to video that's going to have a bright future. <laughs> awesome. Uh, just to add, plus one on the video, video works well, and any projection out there in the past, I don't know, 12 months shows that it's just going to grow exponentially in the next five years. 
So definitely video is, uh, is one. Continuing on native, uh, which is the next favorite buzzword out there. I think it's going to grow and then it's going to consolidate like every other uh, uh, format out there. Uh, I think it's important to, uh, to put it out there and to make sure that native stays clear and clean in terms of disclosure to the users because it could be very confusing in terms of the user experience and as long as you keep the user experience very clear and the user understands that this is promoted, it's an ad and not kind of disguised or camouflaged within the content with no disclosure. I think that's a, that's a key factor that uh, I've already seen a few very good examples and a few bad examples uh, of, so uh, I, th I think that's an important part. For, for me personally, what I, what I think when I see the future, right, so obviously programmatic is a big thing, right? Everyone in this room, first off, I mean, how many people in this room are actually developing apps right now? Fantastic, that's pretty much everyone. Okay, great. So you're all engaged, you're all really excited, I hope you're all enjoying your day. Um, so realistically, we all want automated, right? You guys want the easiest way to make money, you want it to be as, as simplified as possible, and know that you can turn it on or turn it off whenever you want, right? So programmatic is a great solution, right? And then also with programmatic, you have all the data that's going into it. So big data, everyone's talking about that now, but if you're able to harness that data to find what your sweet spot is for your particular app, you can leverage, you can leverage millions of other users, everyone else's experience for your own specific need. And I think that's really cool, right? You don't, you no longer need 10 years of your own data to decide, okay, this is what we think the market's gonna do, or this is what we think a user's gonna do. Now you have it in real time because a lot of other people are also providing that, right? What I think a big feature that, that people haven't touched on yet is global. So when we think of a successful app, most of us in the room here would be like, I wanna be number one in the US, right? I wanna be the number one app in the US app store. But there are massive, massive mobile consumption in, uh, in all other countries, right? Southeast Asia is getting crazy. Latam's blowing up pretty quickly. So you have to start thinking, not just getting big in the US, because we know this is a hyper, hyper competitive market, but what if you become the biggest app in Brazil? Or what if you become the biggest app in France? You now have a huge foothold. And everyone that's in France that's using an app is gonna have a trickle effect, there's gonna be a morality, and it will ultimately spread to the US. When we look at WhatsApp, they're really not that huge in the US. I mean, I know probably people in this room have it on their phone, but active users, not really. But if you go to Europe, everyone's on WhatsApp. You cannot send a text message unless it's through WhatsApp. I mean, obviously you can, but no one really does. So when you're thinking about how am I going to optimize my app, how am I gonna increase the lifetime value of the users of my app, find the right geo for your app. And don't just be so focused on US. Think globally, because in 10 years, we will have a pretty, pretty baseline level of consumption, not like it is now where the US is so heavily and we, we've got such deep smartphone penetration. China's blowing up like crazy, so just keep that in mind. I think another opportunity that programmatic's gonna bring to the space is apps that make money selling advertising. You're gonna have the opportunity to syndicate their audiences off of their app. So for instance, I, I have a finance app. I know that this user is interested in finance. They're going to be worth something to the advertisers that I'm already selling ads to if they're not in my app. So I can go ahead and target those users across other apps via exchanges like OpenX. Awesome. Uh, so yes, you're a, a very sophisticated audience, obviously. So thanks for pointing that. Um, so yeah, so anything else like folks on the panel want to talk about? Um, if not, we could open up to questions. I think a couple of comments on the last thing for us as programmatic came up, you know, at, at OpenX. I mentioned we have the SDK with tools. We bundle a video player with the SDK, um, as well as a bunch of tools around native. So for example, if you wanted to put native video straight into your app and monetize it without having a sales force, um, you can do that, right? You can just pick it up, you can plug it into our exchange and we'll help to fill that. And we think that's something that's going to build over time. Um, on the on the other side, you may just want to enable and be testing new ad formats, and that's something that we support. So thanks to the guys for bringing that up. Um, so yeah, what, what, anything else that I guess is kind of important in the industry around maximizing LTV, or anything that folks want to shout out or ask uh, the panel? Yeah. You have, can you help us? <laughs> All right. We've actually heard a lot of questions, or a lot of panelists speak about video today, and just it would be great to get a little insight um, where you think 
quality of video is going to sort of make or break what you do. You know, everything from like a really rough iPhone to a $30,000 produced, you know, with 3D graphics and animation. Kind of what, where do you think you, you need to go in terms of the kind of video you use to get this kind of return? I personally don't think it really matters. Honestly, it depends on what you are trying to capture in that video. So we've seen great stuff that's come from a camera phone. We, you know, some of the best news footage is from some guy on a camera phone that's capturing it in real time. So it's really about what are you trying to create in that. If you want to create kind of like a, a wholesome local feel, take your iPhone out and record a quick interview and be like, this is why I think this app is great. And then someone will go download it, right? It's really about what are you trying to capture in that video more so than, oh, I have all the best special effects and it's the highest quality of editing and everything is perfect. It's more, what do I want people to take away from watching this? I think uh, people are being a contrarian to you. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think it depends. I think there are a lot of types of apps that will work great with a generic or a basic level video. I don't know, if you go to hardcore gamers and you show them a basic video, I doubt that will work great. Um, you have to know your audience. Uh, and if this is a hardcore game produced by this crazy cool indie studio that doesn't have the funds to do that, but they are going out at it at a unique approach and saying, listen guys, we didn't have crazy funds to, uh, to run this, kind of like a Kickstarter approach where you can show who you really are in, in some ways, but share the message, show some cool visuals and just make the users understand what you really do. It could work. There are some segments I won't. Can I just, can I, real quick, um, the Doritos commercials for the Super Bowl, those are all user created, submitted, and they are a resounding hit. And I think most people would consider that just like a massive win for Doritos. And Doritos just said, cool, we'll just slap our label on it and we're good. So I do agree that you, like if you were gonna go for it, go big. But at the same time, don't feel like if you don't have the money to make it, it won't be successful, right? Because you can have a lot of fun with things. And sometimes, like I think of like when you're talking about hardcore games, I was thinking Twitch TV. One of the best advertisements for any game is just going and watching some guy or some girl playing the game with a granular feed, and there's all sorts of chat going on, but you see the real time, and it's fun. I think for a lot of games, you could seriously just take a screenshot or like a five-second grab of Twitch, boom. There's 10,000 comments, everyone loves it, go play it. All right, cool, I'll go down for it. One more in the back. I have a, I have a slightly dumb question. No dumb How question. do I calculate LTV? How do you calculate LTV was the question? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can get you can get like hyper hyper focused and really really deep, but really it's what do you consider the lifetime of your user, and how much do you think you can realistically achieve from them? So just that times that. No formula. Can we get a board in? <laughs> okay, great. Oh, one more. Since we're talking about LTV, you guys said 30 days. Um, is that based on any category or is that any specific type of app or does it differ? It, it absolutely differs. Um, I would say that typically in, for instance, like gaming, developers are typically going to make money within the first couple days or they're not going to make money at all. Um, in like utility subscription style apps, you're typically going to have like a free period, a trial period. After that, it can be up to 30 days before a user actually spends any money and you monetize them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, travel uh, six to nine months in some cases before you're actually going to recognize revenue. And so you have to have some sort of solution. Uh, Asaf mentioned being able to keep that data in-house. There are plenty of solutions out there that would allow you to do it via like a, like a software as a service model where you're going to be able to see where the user came from in terms of marketing channels, what they've done leading up to the actual monetization. And then after the monetization, allow you to, I mean, in mobile, everyone has that static user device. So you can actually port them out of the platform and then take action on them in other ways. Another cool addition to that is uh, my favorite newsreader called Feedly. 
uh, I saw a graph of uh, one of their founders that showed that the longer the user keeps on using their app, there is a higher chance for them to convert to a paying user, which completely contradicts almost all gaming models in monetization. The graph is amazing. It's like you see people keep on using the app and only after 12 months, 18 months, they only start converting at a higher pace. And the more they stay, the higher the, the, odd the chances they have to convert. So there are definitely no rules in this. So that's a great argument for re-engagement ads, right? <laughs> keep driving them back, keep driving them back, and kind of push them over. I guess I would kind of liken it to how you market a movie. Uh, you know, there's release that's across you know, different countries. You have a decision as to how long you're going to keep it in theaters. You're going to release it on DVD, Netflix, and then syndicate it out to like TV networks, for example. Um, if there's you know a, a basically a half-life that ends, lifetime value is going to go along with that. If it's a news app, for example, if it's a utility, if it's uh, you know travel retail, you're going to be much more concerned with that lifetime value as you manage the relationship with the client.